Hello, I'm Adriano. Let's talk about sustainable pace. Interesting to have you here. I, every time I talk about sustainable pace, I don't know if uh, people that are here are the right people because I think the, the right people doesn't have time to come here. So you have a mission maybe to, to take something that eventually, if you learn something, eventually you can take this, this message to them. So you have a mission right now. Well, uh, it's not a, an exact science, uh, so I, 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 I'm going to share some, some thoughts, so my thoughts. And I have some white hair, so I can even talk about 20 years ago when I started uh, getting involved in, in, uh, and and uh, I, I first learned about uh, sustainable pace. So let's go through this uh, story, and feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. And I have five or six stories, and I can cut in the middle. So let's see how the time goes. And yeah, I wanted to start uh, with this uh, with this guy and uh, Kent Beck. Who knows what Kent Beck did? Someone uh, doing a shot? Edu Manifesto? Uh, yeah, he signed it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but. Uh, Sorry, XP. Yeah, that's that's great. That's great. XP. So he he kind of invented the XP from if you hear from him the story. He invented it in in two days, like uh, uh, before going to a client to propose something. So he he put this name, and before that he also invented TDD. He invented uh, he created S unit in Smalltalk, and after that he invented J unit. So this guy when I started coding uh, back 20 years ago, beginning of 2000s. Uh, this guy influenced me a lot. So I, I, I was a C programmer, so I started using C unit, and then, then I switched to Java. And, and in Java, then, uh, of course, G unit, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, the main library for, for unit tests. And back that time, when he wrote Extreme Programming Explained in 99, uh, he w he started talking about sustainable pace, and and back that time it was not called sustainable pace. He was calling that 40 hours a week, so that was how it started. And then later he he himself um, he he proposed to to change the name from 40 hours a week to sustainable pace. And after all, uh, today if we enter the XP site, it's set a sustainable, measurable and predictable pace. So this is from Kent, uh, Kent Beck. And later in 2015, he started, uh, he, he talked about his story. And back that time, he said that, uh, in 2015, he said that, OK, XP was too focused on programming, on developers. But uh, nowadays, uh, if we talk about uh, what we need to do and iterate, uh, he proposed to iterate and think and be inspired by other methods like uh, Lean Startups because Lean Startups uh, do the whole iteration through the client and in not, not just in the programming. So it considers more than, than, than the programming. And so my proposal here is to think about sustainable pace, uh, not just for the, in the programming perspective, but looking around what is around and how to how to bring sustainable pace. Uh, if I rephrase uh, Uncle Bob, Uncle Bob normally says that why we are always late, why we why we have uh, why we are not meeting our schedule, uh, or why we are always late. So his way of thinking is that we are uh, we think that we are slow, and then we want to cut corners to become faster, and then by cutting corners we we don't take care of quality. We forgot about quality. So then, uh, ultimately, we start uh, dealing with a mess. And, and this is where we, we continue. Uh, we, we started uh, losing quality. And, and then we, we started losing time, wasting time. And there is where we, 
we, we lose ourselves and, and that's why we create a mess and we are late. So this is Uncle Bob thinking. So, but uh, for the programming, for the code itself, we have clean code, we have clean architecture that prevents us to, to create a mess. So we already have some standards that we can set to ourselves and, and avoid uh, getting into this situation. So my thought here is uh, what else we can do to avoid a mess to avoid getting into this, uh, this situation with sustainable, uh, in an unsustainable pace. And this morning, uh, uh, there was a talk with uh, Tobias Modig, and he asked uh, for the audience, uh, why do you cut corners? So the most voted one was the pressure from management to deliver, then also pressure from yourself to deliver, and eventually other reasons, pressure from team to deliver. So it's not, uh, why do we cut corners? It's not because we don't appreciate quality, because we don't know what to do. So it's always uh, something, well, the, the winner here is something about the managers. So it's, uh, it's the system uh, that uh, makes us cutting corners. And then uh, as I am sharing my thought, it's, this is one of the root cause for uh, arriving in a sustainable pace. So. Uh, then my first, uh, this first piece here, my first thought is that uh, uh, in order to avoid, um, to, av to, to, to bring sustainable pace, to achieve sustainable pace, so I, I bring it on take, uh, as a takeaway, frequently del frequent delivery, because that was what Kent Beck thought uh, in the beginning. So if you read the book, uh, extreme, extreme uh, programming. Uh, when, he's, when he talks about 40 hours a week, he's not uh, bringing something new, it's not uh, magic. So he, it's all about uh, delivering the frequently and then the client will be there with you. And, and so that's why I bring, just as a starting point, frequent delivery. Then fasting forward, so uh, I started in 2000, then fasting forward for 2005. I started a company with, uh, with some colleagues, and interestingly enough, one of our first clients were uh, based in, in Belgium. It was Aprico, the name of the, the company. It still exists. And well, we, we started talking about uh, Edu and, and all these methods. So, but back that time, it was, it was not known for, from uh, anyone. No one knew that, and, but we wanted to to, to sell projects like a software factory, but having the, the client as a product owner. So that's what we, we wanted to, to do. And we, we thought that, hey, these things will be the mainstream soon. And we anticipated ourselves and we, we started this company. And uh, well, it was a nice environment. As you can see this uh, picture here, we are throwing the renting sign away. And, and we use that, uh, that house that was not far from the, from the beach. We use it as a base to, 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 bring, to, to build the company. The issue with this, uh, with this company uh, was that uh, the selling cycle was long. Why? Because we wanted to sell a project as a software factory, but we, wanted, we needed to explain our method. We needed to explain that, okay, we are not going to, to plan everything up front. You, uh, you client, you have a a role, you will be the product owner or, or something like that uh, back that time. And well, uh, the solution in this case, that time, uh, there was a lot of uh, discussion about contracts, open scope, closed scope, and, uh, and we needed to create a, an umbrella to protect our, the way that we work. Uh, and this umbrella is, uh, was the contract. So we created the contracts uh, that uh, that helped the, the interaction with the client, and uh, and in this contract we put uh, in this example uh, we did estimate uh, using points back that time, and we create some mid-term uh, burn-down charts, and with if we have some deviation from that uh, burn-down, a deviation back that time we used 20 percent, then we could have some penalties. Well. It happened that we have some, we had some deviation, but it never happened that we we have, we had penalties. 
Uh, with this long selling cycle, we, we had the, the client close to us, and I like to bring a metaphor about the taxi cab. Imagine that you, you want to send a parcel to the airport, and you need to run with this parcel, and, and you bring a taxi, and you say to the taxi, hey, uh, I need to deliver this, uh, this parcel in the, in the airport. And then, uh, okay, the, the, the taxi is, uh, okay, I'll do my best, I'll deliver this parcel. And in the way to the airport, the taxi uh, uh, suffers a lot, of, uh, a lot of delays, there is a lot of traffic, everyone is going to the same direction, everything was locked, and, and the taxi does really a good job, he cuts corners, he goes to the sidewalk, and uh, he even receives some fines, and he's... Uh, for for speeding limits, and then uh, he arrives in the in the airport, and it's too late. So the 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 flight was already gone. And he calls me, and then he tells me, "Hey, the parcel. Uh, I could not deliver the parcel." In this situation, I will be mad. I'll be. I will think, "Hey, Texas, you didn't do a good job." Uh, so because uh, I'm not aware about everything that the taxi suffered, and and he did his best. Uh, while on the other hand, if I jump in the taxi with the parcel myself in the, in the taxi, and I see all the effort that the taxis did, uh, I'm inside the taxi. So when we arrive and we see, okay, we failed, we, we were not able to deliver, then at least I, I saw that the whole, I see the whole story and my conclusion eventually can be totally different. So we uh, bring the client close, we put the client inside the taxi. So that's, that's the idea. Uh, just showing then uh, some uh, piece here, a document. Uh, we, every, in every iteration, we, we um, uh, this is a document from 2009, so it's really old. We show the, to, to the client what's the list of uh, things that we, we plan to deliver. We cut the things that we, we haven't delivered. So, this is an estimate in, in, in points. And we have a uh, long term burn down chart. This is uh, five or six months. And then we, we steer based on this burn down chart. And yeah, this is the one that uh, could lead us to, to a penalty. So, we, we have always the, the client close to us. And, and that leads me to, to a second take away. So um, you need to create con contracts that will, will foster this collaboration, will prevent you to, to derail, will prevent you to, to, to arrive in a situation of uh, unst unsustainable pace. So outside of the code, you, you need to take care. You, you cannot sign contracts with uh, closed scope and detailed closed scope, this kind of thing. <coughs> This kind of thing. So, moving on, moving on. Um, now, I think you see your name now. Okay, I have some colleagues that uh, from uh, this experience, fasting forward to 2015, around 2015, we, I was uh, invited to lead this this team, the the one in the left corner, MIB. It uh, stands for Men in Black, as they wanted to, to say, but it stands for Monitoring, Infrastructure, and Database. Um, and we were just 10 to support uh, the 250 people around, 200, not just developers, but also analysts, QA. And we, we also support some, we maintained the, the environment for, of some clients. So clearly, that time we were a bottleneck, so we, we, there are too many uh, people for us to support, and we were a bottleneck. We didn't have that level of automation that we used to see right now in a in a DevOps team. So uh, I want to think about bottlenecks and uh, how to manage bottlenecks, how to deal with bottlenecks. Uh, if we uh, here I see three steps. So first, when I say bottleneck, I mean we already have a definition. Uh, we, we already tried to solve a bottleneck. So in this street, hey, in a short term, we cannot uh, 
we cannot uh, solve the bottleneck. We already tried to bring someone new. We already tried to automate, but in the short term, we don't have a solution. So in that moment, we have a bottleneck. So how, how you deal with that? Uh, inspired by a book from the 80s, 80, 84, the, the book, The Go, maybe you, you know it. So the first step in the short term is to subordinate all the other steps in your system to that bottleneck while you work in the solution in the mid or long term, and then you, you increase the throughput of your system. What I mean is that uh, I was leading an infrastructure team that was responsible for uh, uh, creating new environments, maintaining the environments, doing deployments, monitoring, executing scripts, validating scripts, uh, scripts in, for the database, and we were the bottleneck. But uh, before that, as this, this, uh, this street, uh, before that we have analysis, we have developers, we have uh, many things in the system that happen in the left, and, uh, and then uh, what we, uh, what, uh, what's the idea to manage the bottleneck? So here in a theoretical way, it's to subordinate everything else to the bottleneck in the left, and uh, why we work in the, in the ideal solution. So now, coming from the, from the theoretical to the steps that were, that, was, uh, that were done there, instead of putting pressure on people to work more and more, to, to, to deal with more demands, uh, the short-term solution was to subordinate the, the whole system to reduce the velocity of the, the, the system uh, uh, to the capacity that we have. Uh, in this example, so we, we did some things like, uh, um, first we visualize our work, we, we put everything uh, in the system, we had some demands that were coming, not uh, through, the, through the system, not, with the, uh, not officially, so we, we organized these. Then um, if we come back to this screen, we have three different departments, the one below here was the issue, it, it, which is the, the orange one. We know that these ones were the, the ones that most uh, demanded things and were, um, it was more difficult to deal with them. So what we did is uh, to reserve some capacity. So we had two people dealing with the green area, green department, two people attending the, the request from the yellow area, and three people with attending the request from the orange area. So by that we isolate the problem and we set a capacity. So you have, you can count with three people uh, for that people, for that, uh, for that area. And okay, for that, uh, for that area also, uh, daily refilling backlog. So we, we define what was the priority for that time, for that day uh, in, that, in that area. And we limited the, the number of urgencies so now, not everything can be an urgency. We, we say like, okay, you, you can have one urgency per day. You need to organize yourselves to uh, not to bring five, 10 urgencies, things that needs to be solved right away. So you limit yourself. And uh, I'm gonna talk more about that later, but you, uh, you set, uh, we set SLAs per services. So we define uh, what are our services and we started measuring how long, uh, what's my capacity, how many uh, things I can do at the same day, how, uh, what's the time that I, I, I take to, to deal with that, to, to, to bring a solution. So that's short term, we, we basically we manage the capacity, we, by, we subordinate everything else to our capacity by limiting the, the requests, managing the demand, and in the mid-long term, why, why in the mid-long term? That's not the focus for now, but then we work on the real solutions like uh, Docker, Rancher, back that time. We used OpenShift for an internal cloud, so we, we bring the automation that we needed, and we increase the team that was not feasible in the short term. Um, so, manage bottlenecks. So this is a takeaway. So normally, uh, if, you, if your team is a bottleneck, 
you put the pressure on your team and you want to, them to do more and more. But if you are not, uh, if you tried already everything and you are not uh, bringing this, uh, this idea of subordinating the, the everything else to your bottleneck, or if you want to say in, in other words, if you are not uh, managing the demands, you are not, uh, you are just uh, putting everything on top of, uh, of your team and this is not sustainable pace. So have that in mind, manage it bottlenecks. Fasting forward a bit, uh, a mission in Abu Dhabi. So, well, I, I moved from, from, from Brazil to Abu Dhabi and in Abu Dhabi, I, I joined this, uh, this, this project and it was a project with the central uh, bus and several systems attached to the bus. So we have the uh, hospital management system, CRMs, uh, business rules extracted to, to um, externalize it. And we did this kind of thing. So uh, client arrives in the, a patient, arrives in a clinical, and he claims uh, to, be, to, to do some treatment. So it arrives in the, in the OHI, in the hospital system. It goes to the, to the bus to check if uh, in the external, external rules to check if uh, this claim was positive or negative, if, if we could proceed with the, with, the, with the treatment or not. BRMS, the business rules management system, could eventually trigger some other calls to CRM, to the financial system to check if uh, the client is in a good in a good shape he, if he's paying and then we return back the, the information to the to the hospital system so that's the kind of thing that we did uh, we were doing and there were many vendors one of the vendors that i was working on uh, working with uh, was uh, the responsible for esb and and bpm and you can imagine so if there is an issue in, in this kind of architecture and everyone working together, uh, who is the one to blame in this case? Anyone guess? Architect. The architect, okay, eventually, eventually, all right. Well, I would say that uh, if two systems are not integrating, first, the first one to blame is the, those that are taking care of the ESB. So maybe the architect of the ESB. And well, that was a, a central piece. So we needed to deal, we were taking care of the ESB and, and BPM, and we need to deal with all the other vendors. So we were really a central piece. And the client itself had a bit more, uh, two other teams, the QA and, and, and some business team. So there were around 150 people involved. And my mission was uh, short term, it was uh, seven months, but the project had already started when I arrived and then the project continued when, when, uh, when I left. And, and when I arrived, it was mid-June and, and there was a plan, a beautiful plan, like a roadmap of release. So, okay, we just delivered uh, release two, now we are in the middle of release three and then uh, looking forward for release four. I was looking for this release four because uh, we were in the middle of release three, but then I realized that we didn't have a, a, a plan. Well, I was not seeing things. Uh, I was not able to communicate what we were doing about uh, on the release three. And uh, well, I was in Abu Dhabi. I was with uh, five, eight people in Abu Dhabi and, and the rest of the, the, the teams in, in our company were distributed around uh, Europe and, and, and Lebanon. So it was really uh, an experience, uh, different uh, 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 organization, let's say. And uh, I didn't have contact with the teams directly myself. Uh, I, I had, uh, well, uh, I was not there to see what, uh, what they were doing, but what happened is that uh, through the time, the time was passing and I discovered that uh, I, was, um, I was receiving wrong information, let's say like that. People were really, um, were not telling me the truth because I was close to the client, I would report to the client. So even the, the CEO of the company was not telling me the truth. So the truth was that we were still working on the, 
on the release two, doing bug fixes and and trying to, to really to get rid of release two while we were supposed to work on the release three. And I was even okay. I, I think I'm gonna be useful on release four, but uh, um, after all, we were uh, much further than uh, than that. So the issue here was that. Uh, all the plans were there was no um, no no commitment from people to to those plans. Those dates were were settled by someone else, and and we just needed to deliver. And with this uh, complexity of uh, multiple systems, there was no uh, this complexity was not taken into consideration, and there was no transparency. Even me inside the company, I took some time to discover what was really happening and and uh, well that was uh, that was tough let's say and what happened is that uh, through july august uh, no there was a game of uh, of blaming no one wants to to say that no none of the vendors want to say that uh, hey i'm late i want to be able to deliver these or that because the first one to raise the hand to to say that uh, uh uh, to say that we um, this person would be this uh, vendor would be blamed. So even the client was not able to say that uh, hey we we were not uh, we want delivered because uh, they want they want didn't want to, to be marketed as as the ones to blame. So there uh, it happened that uh, uh, there was uh, something missing in the contract. So no one said who was responsible for the testing data. And uh, and then what was uh, the culprit was the testing data, the missing te responsible for testing data, not not anyone. So we found a solution somehow. Some heads were cut. My boss uh, was cut. Uh, there was another boss. Uh, and what we did? So we had already a test case, very uh, mature test case for the for release three. And uh, and we we simply uh, did a burn down burn down chart for the test case. We used the first two weeks, first uh, first periods to measure our velocity. So how many test cases we we can make pass, uh, make them pass? How many uh, we can do that? And then based on that, we we knew our velocity, and then we 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 draw this uh, this burn down. So this is not a fictitious uh, estimate. This is not something that someone put a date and you need to deliver in that date, this is scope. So uh, by measuring how many we did in the beginning, we were able to forecast based on, on real delivery. And yeah, okay, at the end we, did, we delivered in December what was planned to, to deliver in July, but at least with this, uh, during this period the, the confidence was was back and, and we brought back trust to the to the through everyone that was was involved and well the issue from my point of view here is uh, overtime driven what I call overtime driven overtime driven commitment so you cannot uh, commit to something without being really uh, confident that you were able to to achieve it. So what uh, sometimes happened, I, I'm just bringing this story, this example, what sometimes happened is that we are already counting on a lot of extra hours in order to, uh, to deliver something. And this is what I'm against it. So Kent Beck from, the, from his first book, he says, uh, uh, well, in one week, if we, are, if we need to do some extra hour over time, it's good, but uh, it's okay, it's acceptable. But if you arrive in the second week, in the second Monday, and you say, "Hey, I need uh, we need to meet our, in order to meet our goals, we need to do more uh, over time," then you ha you already have a problem because it's uh, it's repetitive. Uh, something else about the overtime. Uh, we even well, I, I won't explore that much, but uh, there are some studies that say more than. Uh, 55 hours per week, uh, it increased the, the risk of stroke, for example. In, in Japan, they, they are 
they have a different culture there and they work a lot. So uh, they even have a word for deaths based on, on, on due to the to extra work. So it's karoshi and they have statistics on that. And, and well, other than that, over time, what, what over times lead? So over times uh, is a cause of errors. So uh, if you are working more than, I don't know, this 54 hours, of course you are doing some errors and then you, you need to, to come back and, and fix that. And guess what, who, who will be responsible? Who will be responsible uh, to fix this, uh, this, uh, these things, who will be responsible for bad code, for issues with bad code. I have an example here. It's not about overtime, but it's uh, Volkswagen CEO uh, saying, blaming a couple of software engineers uh, due to uh, uh, cheating the system that uh, measures the emission of, uh, of diesel. This happened in 2000. 15, 2016. Corporate so. level, is that correct? Two answers to this. Um, first of all, the investigations are ongoing, but this was not a corporate decision from my point of view. To my best knowledge today, the corporation in no board meeting or no supervisory board meeting has authorized this, but this was a couple of software engineers who put this in for whatever reasons, and I would also like to find out, and I fully it agree to so you. So yeah, sorry for bringing that, that but uh, this is to, to make sure that we understand that uh, we are responsible for, the, the, for what we, we deliver and the, the company w won't cover us, so uh, we are responsible, we have the power. So moving on, then uh, no overtime driven commitment, that's my, my point on this, uh, on this uh, learning from this experience. Well, fasting forward to uh, finally what we are doing in, in Aries, uh, at least uh, around me, what I see. We are uh, working in a, in, a, in a project, in a rollout for a new system for a bank, and uh, it's, a big, it's a big bank. And I bring just this uh, strategy here just to, to share what we, are, uh, what we are planning. So we, we, we are working for uh, two years, and we we managed to to uh, deliver frequently based because of our strategy. So our strategy, if you see the uh, uh, our strategy, is starting with um, the innovators. It's user driven, so based on the on the profile of the of the user. So we have for each uh, for each area. For example, in the bank, we have allocation area, the loans allocation. The legal department, the risk, uh, uh, the risk departments, the um, engineers, etc. So for each functional uh, area, we have um, we 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 grow in this area. We deliver the system and we roll out the, these new systems first for people that are more innovators than early adopters, than late majority laggards, etc. So we uh, by doing that, we are able to deliver frequently. That was our first idea, uh, first uh, takeaway. The second takeaway is, was uh, we have a contract. So this is our rollout strategy. We can consider that as a contract, let's say, to, to help us to, to go through, through the, the rollout process. And, well, um, let me jump this part here. I told you that uh, maybe I, I would reorganize. So. We wanted to have some uh, strategy to to estimate, and and then uh, I went to. I was never a fan of uh, estimating in hours and and then putting some margin or using any any miracle way to 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 arrive on the on the solution uh, on on precise estimates and making a plan of, on that. So what I wanted is to to measure. Uh, um, our our velocity, uh, how long we take to 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 deliver something, and then based on that, create our plans. So here's what we did. So we have this life cycle of a user story. You you might have these uh, as well. So you, 
whatever if you call user story or feature or, or anything. So you have a commitment point when the user story is ready to be uh, to start being developed, and then uh, we have uh, architecture work, the development, QA, and then we deliver. So we have two moments that we can uh, start and and finish the clock. So uh, that workflow that we saw before, it's 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 uh, our board, so we can see things in the left, things in the, in the right side of the board. And we have two moments to, to click the clock, so to start or to finish the clock. So by doing that, we were able to reach out this distribution, so call it lead time. Lead time is, let's call it, uh, let's have it uh, um, uh, this, uh, uh, this term here clear that is the time that uh, between the commitment point and the delivery. And uh, in the graph, we can see here uh, that um, the occurrence of uh, lead times around 12, 15, there is a peak. So uh, just for us to, to read the graph together. So we have almost uh, around six and, and, and 12 uh, stories. We have almost uh, 60 stories that, uh, that, um, that had the, that lead time, while in the right side, for example, we had around 15 stories with more than 181 days. I uh, know uh, between 94 and 181 days. So that's how we read the graph. So uh, reading the graph, then what are our conclusions here? Is that um, the mean is uh, the mean, not the average. The mean is around uh, 23 days. And if we want to say something for our stakeholders about confidence, so we can say that with 80% uh, of the time, it's less than 52 days. So uh, we can already uh, say something about that. So with this, we, we can provide some, some uh, estimates. Without estimating anything, we can, we can provide some, some dates. And with this, we can build some, some plans. But then uh, there is some, some magic behind it. Uh, I want to talk about this one, this person. Who is this person? Who knows? Uh, OK, it's Fourier. But uh, do you know what Fourier did? You know? You, you raise it? OK, OK. Fourier. So Fourier, uh, he, he lived in. Uh, in the, in the, during the Illuminism and, uh, and uh, Industrial Revolution in the late uh, 1700s, beginning of 1800s. And he, he was a scientist and he studied the, the nature of the, of the waves. So, for example, wave of light, wave of, uh, of, uh, of sound. So, uh, what he came up with was that we can uh, add wa waves one to the other, just like this, or we can subtract one wave from the other. So this is another uh, example. So we, the wave in red plus the wave in blue plus the wave in green, it uh, creates this uh, yellow wave summing up. So for those that uh, that surf, uh, know what I what I mean when one wave comes with the other and then uh, suddenly the, there is a peak. So that was Fourier. And uh, we can call it Fourier analysis or Fourier transform. And if you have a, 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 some, uh, well, your, your headset, your headset has a powerful noise suppression. So you need to thank Fourier because uh, what the noise suppression is doing is just uh, uh, removing the noise from the, from the wave. So this is kind of a transformation. Uh, a Fourier transform applied to the to the wave, and now talking about colors, we can remove the waves uh, of colors from the infrared or from the infra from the ultraviolet, and and you uh, spectrum, and you will see different colors that we you were not seeing before. So you can do Fourier transform also for colors, and then I bring back you to this. Uh, this graph here, and then you can start imagining a wave. So it's a kind of a wave, it's not perfect, it's not a, 
uh, definitely it's not a normal distribution, it's more a, like a log normal distribution with a long tail in the right, but it's, it's kind of ugly, but it's, it's, it's a wave. So maybe we can apply for here analysis here. And well, I plot, this graph is plotting the lead times for the stories. And normally we don't differentiate the stories from, uh, so either we are fixing bugs, so this is one thing that we do. We are doing refactories, we are doing stories, but uh, uh, normally we, we are accommodated with the stories. We don't split these, we don't create other classifications uh, uh, inside the stories, the story type A, story type B. So what I come up with uh, while doing this, uh, this Fourier transform was differentiating special stories than fast tracks. So uh, fast, uh, we, we discovered that those stories that didn't, uh, in our case, that didn't require a new UI component, we call it fast track stories. And those that need a new UI component, uh, we call it special stories. And then for each one, we have different policies, different way of, uh, of working with them, basically through the same uh, workflow, but uh, one needed more uh, design up front, another didn't need uh, design uh, involvement, and, and that was a differentiation of, of his story. So by doing that, we were already able to remove from the, um, from the, the wave in the left, from the, the gray one, we were already able to see stories, uh, the, the fast track and the special stories uh, to differentiate them. And then we have two different waves. But I go, I continue doing that. So imagine that, uh, well, okay, what's the point of differentiating this, the, these waves? So imagine that uh, we, you have these, uh, these requirements. So we, we want to, to show in the screen uh, information about loans allocation by country. And then uh, the requirements say that we need uh, to show uh, in a graphic way and also in a tabular way. But we have a tabular uh, UI component. We don't have a graph uh, component. So instead of estimating and then negotiating and, and splitting the story involving uh, maybe UI architect, et cetera, talking to business and the designer, we could already uh, say that, hey, if you want um, just uh, the one in the left to start with a tabular, it's going faster, it's going to be delivered much faster than if we do the, the one with the graph. So we shift let, left the estimating, shift left, shift left, shift left, sorry, uh, in, the, in the board. So we, we transform, we, we transfer the responsibility of estimating from the developers uh, to the business, to someone that is requesting. And that saves times from everyone. And it's a good estimating because it's, it's based on data. It's based on the real lead time. And we can do it again and again. So a new uh, Fourier transform. So we, we have the green one, fast tracks. We have special stories. Then we realize that for us, uh, uh, well, that, these are uh, our case, so you can if you want to apply this idea of Fourier, uh, you can find your own criteria. So first, uh, fast track stories were those that reuse UI components. Now we are differentiating special stories with external dependence and without external, external dependence. So it was uh, an easy, uh, it's an easy way when the story is coming and then we just uh, analyze, hey, these will need data from a new system. These will need to interact. Uh, with the other system. So we, we differentiate special stories and uh, with and without dependence, plus the fast track. So now we have three beautiful colors, three uh, waves uh, much more clear. So the one, the red one is really uh, one thing. They are in different scales. So the red one uh, uh, spans, the, the peak spans from seven to 100 days. The blue one from five to 43 days, the peak is there. And the fast tracks are from two to 15. So the variation reduce. And with that, 
what brings uh, what we have is that we have much more precision. So, okay, uh, business, if you want to us to do a special story with dependencies, sometimes it's needed, but then unfortunately, based on the historical data, we, uh, we might need 93 days uh, with this level of confidence, confidence um, to deliver. While the special stories without dependence, 37, and fast tracks, so bring us fast tracks, bring, bring us more and more fast tracks, reuse the UI components. With this, we do the job in 14 days or less with 80% of confidence. And well, I plotted two years, two years and a half, almost two years and a half of data uh, in order to bring this information, just to have some uh, volume and, and, and show uh, the things here. But normally I use the, in order to bring this, these uh, days in confidence level, I use the last three months of, of data and then uh, we, uh, I always update this, this information and, and then uh, what was in the past, uh, I, I don't keep them. And wow. So by this way, you stop totally, you stop uh, estimating stories, but in a responsibly way. So you, uh, you bring data and then people can create plans over, over that. And we always have a long tail, normally a long tail in the right side. So um, then you can bring this information to retrospectives, analyze those cases. What happened in those cases that, that things derailed and then you bring it, you, you make it better. So you can improve based on data. And uh, well, something, some, just a quick thought here, the first idea on top. Uh, what if I have a fixed delivery date? What if I, uh, I'm not free to, to, to deliver something uh, based on the lead time? I really need to, to deliver that. In the beginning of this uh, rollout, we had, uh, these are my data, so maybe, maybe you have more real fixed delivery date, but uh, we have 80% of the stories had uh, fixed delivery date. But then when challenged, when we challenge these fixed delivery dates, it comes out that just 2%, just 2% of the stories had fixed delivery dates. We need to, to come up with, a, with the story to deliver in a, we, we had a real deadline for that. So just 2%. And uh, take away then in this case, data driven commitments. So play with your data and, and then you commit over that. Uh, without guesses, guesses and etc. Doing that, you you avoid uh, you avoid unsustainable pace all at once. And moving on, hey, I would love to continue this conversation. There are several ways to continue this conversation. Uh, you can join me in the in LinkedIn. You can access my my website. Uh, you can do a training. I hope I'm. I'm not as nervous in the training as I, I was here with this intimidating screen size. And on top of that, uh, we can work together. So we, you can join Iris and, or at least uh, get to know Iris. And with that, uh, time is almost over, but um, thank you very much and see you around. <laughs>